All right, can you hear me okay? Does that work all right? Okay, well, first and foremost, thanks everyone for choosing to spend your evening with me. I will try to make it worth your time here. So my name is Andrew Gangadine, and today I'm gonna to be talking to you about the search for life in the universe. So yeah, pretty cool, I think. So let's see what we learned by the end of this, right? So I'm gonna start off in a spot you might not expect. So when we talk about studying ancient life, this is probably the type of stuff you think of, right? So we've got your classic T-Rex. Anyone in here like really into fossils by chance? Because if so, you may have seen this one on the top right is called a, anybody know? Anybody know what that's called? Trilobites. Yes, yeah, trilobites or trilobites. And on the bottom here, the shell looking thing is called a brachiopod. But what I wanna do here is I'm gonna plot these on, if we start here when the earth was formed, we think somewhere around four and a half billion years ago to today. So the T-Rex, which went extinct about 66 million years ago, that's where that is relative to today, right? So that is basically, geologically speaking, yesterday, right? Now, if we look at those trilobites and those brachiopods, they were a lot longer ago. So they lived almost 500 million years ago, still pretty close to the modern earth, right? But what you might not know is that if we go back to this, let me show you here, this Hadean earth, Hadean means hellish, and that's because this is what the planet used to look like, we think. And in case you're wondering, this is not a photograph that was taken. This is an artist reconstruction. We think there was a hazy orange sky. The moon was actually a lot closer to the earth than it is today. Um, we think there was a lot of volcanic landmass that was uh, exposed at the surface and it was steaming. Overall, it would not be a great place to live. You and I certainly could not breathe there. Um, so when you think about alien planets, the first place to look is ancient Earth because it really was an alien planet, at least compared to modern day. But what you might not know is that the oldest evidence for life that we have on Earth, that is, you know, scientists pretty much agree, yes, this is evidence of life, is all the way back here at three and a half billion years old. That's a billion with a B. Um, I always like to talk about the difference in scale here between a million and a billion. So a million seconds is just under two weeks and a billion seconds is about 30 something years, okay? So that's the difference there between a million and a billion. Uh, the human brain, everybody's brain, uh, is just really bad at comprehending that sense of scale. Um, and that's you know a, a good visualization, I think. So a little bit about myself, so you know who I am, why I'm here. So I just moved to this area a couple months ago. I took a new job as a science writer at Yale. So I used to be doing a lot of research and now I am helping to communicate science. So I'm helping faculty communicate their science. Um, I'm involved with some NASA efforts where NASA is really interested in, okay, we wanna make sure when we have new findings that the public knows what we're doing and doesn't misconstrue what we're doing. Um, it turns out a big important part of doing science is then making sure you can adequately convey it as well. So that is what I do now and it's kind of why I'm here today talking to you about science as well. So back when I was actively doing research, my uh, focuses were on astrobiology, which how many of you have heard of astrobiology before? So it's a rather you know, newfangled field that combines a lot of other fields of science from geology, biology, uh, chemistry, basically, you name a physical science, it's got something to do with astrobiology. So it's not just biology, like the name says, but the long definition of astrobiology is the study of the origin, evolution, distribution, and future of life in the universe. So it basically covers everything there. So you have people that are studying life on Earth as an analog. In other words, we think a similar environment to what we might find on another planet. We have people that are studying the ancient Earth to figure out how did life maybe evolve here. And you have people studying strictly what happens when us humans start trying to live elsewhere in outer space. So any type of combination of life in space, that's what astrobiology is. 
paleontology, the sort of paleontology before, right? That's all studying fossils and past life, right? And then origin of life. So at some point, life arose. How did that happen? That also influences how do we look for signs of life on other planets? If we find some random new planet, how do we determine? It's got a lot of the, the chemical elements that we think life likes. It's got stuff that life could be built out of, that life could eat, that all goes into that. And then as for some of uh, the things I've been involved with, so I've been involved with the Perseverance landing site selection. So that is the rover that's currently up there on Mars right now. I'll be talking more about that later. I've also been involved with return sample science. So the rover that's up there now is not only just on Mars, but it's going to be bringing things back to Earth. And then I've a little bit been involved with the human exploration of Mars. Now, I have not been a human that has explored Mars. Nobody has yet, right? But um, NASA's already started to plan for this. And it's, you know, if we're lucky, going to happen 20, 30 years from now. And that's optimistic. This is a picture of me um, standing in. Does anybody want to guess what I'm standing in there? It's kind of, kind of a, a weird random thing there. You can just shout it out. Anybody got a guess? Yeah, I know it's rather nondescript there. So this is me standing in an extinct hot spring. So where I'm standing, there used to be water hot spring. So like at, at Yellowstone or in Iceland, we have, we have hot springs there. And I use pictures of me um, in extinct hot springs because when there's an active hot spring, that's what a picture of me looks like. And I'm standing, you know, they're just outgassing a bunch of uh, much stuff that makes pictures pretty difficult there. So speaking of hot springs, does anybody know what we are looking at here? Once again, feel free to just shout it out there. This is a geyser. It's a very famous geyser. Does anyone know which one? I heard it. Yeah, Old Faithful. This is Old Faithful. Um, so probably the most famous hot spring or geyser in the world. Has anybody been to Yellowstone before? I would recommend it if you haven't. Um, so. This is Old Faithful at max height. It's called Old Faithful because they've got it down to a science of when it will actually guise. And there's a sign in the visitor center that says, you know, 17 minutes from now, it's going to go off. And this is a big boardwalk that you see in the picture right here. Um, and they've got bleachers set up and you can go there and just watch it go off. And um, it's a very cool experience. Probably the second most famous hot spring has anyone seen this one before? Also at uh, Yellowstone National Park. This is called Grand Prismatic Hot Spring, named because of all of the beautiful vibrant colors that you can see there. But what makes these colors, some of it is minerals scattering light, um, but the other main component of all of these beautiful different colors that you see there are a bunch of different microorganisms that live in the water. So. Very, very tiny things love hot springs. They're warm, they've got water, they've got plenty of nutrients. Some of them use sunlight for energy, some of them use chemicals. And so all those different colors that you see are all different microbial communities that call that place home. So, yeah, that's one of them. Yeah, there's, I mean, there is, at one point I could name dozens of them, but that is, that is definitely, that is one of them. Um, cyanobacteria is the big one there that you're seeing. So if you're following with me here, we have extinct hot springs as well, okay? So you can go to places like Yellowstone, like uh, there's some in Iceland as well. There's all over the world. There's some really good ones in New Zealand, for instance. And you can actually go in, break off a piece of old hot spring and then you can go fossil hunting, but not in the way you might expect. So here's how you look for fossils in rocks when you're looking for tiny, tiny, tiny microscopic fossils. So step one, you're gonna try to find a rock. Um, you're gonna try to look for something, and this is where it requires a little bit of expertise. You need to be able to look for a rock that looks like it might have evidence of microscopic life inside of it. Oftentimes that's just some nondescript squiggle in it or different coloration or something like that. What you're gonna do is you're gonna grab that rock, bring it to a saw and you're gonna cut it in half 
And if you want to know what type of saw can cut rocks, it's oftentimes dull saws that are coated with diamond so they can cut through even really, really hard substances. But once you make a nice cut there, you want to glue that onto a glass slide, take it back to the saw, grind off most of it, and then take it to a grinding wheel. And you want to grind that all the way down until there's almost nothing left. And what you're doing there is you're getting it so thin that you can actually shine light through it. So you can look through it like it's a piece of stained glass. And then you can get a microscope and you can put that slide onto the microscope and you can actually go looking for microscopic fossils. Now, when you're looking through a microscope, you can only focus on one plane at a time. So oftentimes we use special types of um, laser light that interact with organic compounds and organics mean uh, things that are made of carbon, which is what most living things are made of. Every living thing has some degree of carbon in it. So when we do that, this is an example of me scanning through a slide. Notice this little area in the center here that is lighting up, right? So if we scan through that a couple times and then we stitch all of those layers together, we get something that looks like this. And I can tell you right here, this is a 350 million year old fossil of a single bacteria. So when we're talking about fossils, yes, you can go out there, you can you know, take your pickaxe, swing it into the ground and find a T-Rex skull, but you can also find far, far older fossils. So these, uh, three and a half billion year old fossils that we find. Actually, for, for those, we don't even have the body of the fossil itself, but the older it gets, you're talking microbial fossils that are really, really, really tiny. And look, this is 10 microns. So a micron is one one thousandth of a millimeter. So we're talking very, very small. Now I know what you're thinking. I'm talking about the search for life in the universe. So far we have not left earth, right? So let's change that now. So now we are going to, anybody know what planet this is? Here's an easy one, right? This is Mars, yes, correct. So the uh, red planet, which is really more kind of orange, right? Doesn't currently look like a place that would be great for life, right? But what if I told you Mars used to look like this? Now, as I put this up here, I'll say, um, there are some people I've spoken to uh, in NASA who are like, this is definitely not accurate. And then the other person at the table says, what do you mean? Yes, it is. We know there used to be water on Mars. We just don't know the exact extent of it. We have evidence of rivers on Mars, of beaches on Mars, whether or not it was a global ocean or something that resulted from more ice melting, still up for debate that exact specifics. But we do know Mars a long time ago used to be a much more hospitable planet. Did they get the water by asteroids crashing into it like we? Yeah, that is still a debated question. Um, it's still debated how Earth exactly got its water. I mean, we all we know is that it definitely did have it at one point. Okay. So what I'm showing you here, this is an aerial view of a hot spring from Earth. This one in particular is just a Google Earth image from a hot spring in Yellowstone National Park. So that little tiny circle you see in the center, that's where the water is coming out. And then all this white stuff that you see is actually a mineral called silica that uh, crashes out of solution. So it's kind of like an experiment you can do at home where if you get salt water and you just keep adding salt to it, eventually you're gonna get salt water plus a mound of salt at the bottom. So only so much salt will dissolve into the water before the water is what's called saturated, meaning it can't hold that salt anymore and it comes out. And that's what's happening with this mineral right here, which is great for fossilizing little tiny bacteria. Now, this is an aerial view of a suspected extinct hot spring on Mars. Now, I will caution you as I put this up, you can do this with a lot of stuff where you say, hey, doesn't that look exactly the same? And in this case, it's kind of, you know, like a white blob, right? So there have been a lot of uh, surface studies we've done. So specifically, this home plate region, as we call it, was visited by the Spirit Rover, which did some studies and determined it's made of the exact same stuff as these Yellowstone hot springs. That being said, we don't have any conclusive proof that that is absolutely a hot spring, but that is one of the leading hypotheses of it. 
So what do we do when we think, okay, we know here on earth, we have evidence for very, very ancient life. It comes from hot springs. We know Mars used to be wet and might've had hot springs. Well, in that case, we build rovers and we send them to other planets, in this case, Mars, and we go looking. So this is how both the Curiosity and now Perseverance rover got there. This is called the uh, Sky Crane. And the reason it's called that is it's still amazing to me that this engineering worked, but the rover just gets lowered down. It lands on the surface of the planet and then this top part flies away. Uh, truly amazing feat of engineering in my opinion. So that is how almost two years ago now, the Perseverance rover landed on Mars. If you followed uh, NASA's rover missions for quite a while, this is almost the exact same build as the Curiosity rover with one major addition, and that is this arm on the end of it here, which I'll talk about in a moment. So the Perseverance rover has a primary mission objective, meaning priority number one is to search for signs of past life on Mars, not present life. So it's not going to like look under rocks to see if it finds any like moss growing there or anything like that. It's looking specifically for extinct life, okay, past life. And that's just because we're landing on parts of the planet that we think there could have been life. Um, we're not dealing with trying to, what happens if we accidentally bring back something that's living. That's a whole other topic that uh, I can get into a little bit more later, but it landed right here on Jezero Crater. Now, if depending on how much you know of your geology, you may have recognized this structure here. This is called a river delta. It's what happens when rivers meet larger bodies of water, like a lake or an ocean, where rivers, as they're rushing, they kick up a bunch of dirt, a bunch of sediment, and then when they meet this giant calm body of water, they just dump out all of this uh, dirt, and it makes this fan-like shape here. So we know this was a place, or at least we, we are pretty sure this was a place that water used to be. So the rover is it's made its way a little bit further along, but it's approximately going to follow this path. And the part that I'm particularly interested in is eventually, if it runs long enough and lasts long enough, it will get to this edge of the crater here where you can see this star, where it's possible we may have uh, impact-induced hydrothermal activity, meaning at one point something hit there, caused a fissure, channeled up magma from the planet, heated the water at the surface and made hot springs. So it's possible there was a hot spring at the end of this. We won't know until we go looking. Um, but the exciting part of when we go looking is that the rover is equipped with these tiny little tubes. And let me show you um, a little bit more about that in just a second. But first, what I wanna draw everyone's attention to is when we're planning for landing sites and whatnot, um, I mentioned I was involved with the landing site selection. Uh, unfortunately, it was not just like me in the room with, you know, saying, no, we're not going there. And yes, we'll go there. Uh, it looked a lot, uh, a little more boring here, right? So this is one of the many landing site selection meetings that went on for uh, about a decade that people were talking back and forth and it got increasingly serious and there were finalists um, it's a lot of scientists who each have their own specialties who meet up together in a room to discuss the pros and the cons of each landing site. We started with hundreds, and then the last like three or four years was just deciding between three sites. So this is how a lot of science works and should work, right? So it's not just one person calling a lot of the shots. It's the community coming together together. Um, Bias is something that naturally will exist. People tend to study things that they think are cool. So of course, the person who studies river deltas is going to be like, we should absolutely go to the river delta site, right, everyone? Um, so there is still a little bit of, uh, you know, personality that gets in there. But these debates go on back and forth. And the actual NASA administrators who run these missions, they're the ones who get to decide the actual landing site at the end. But they take heavy input from the scientific community. And so this is what that science looked like a lot. We had the landing sites and we just ranked them. So you can see some of the criteria we had here is characterizable geologic setting and history, 
Does it have an ancient habitable environment? Does it have a high biosignature preservation potential, which means it have a high uh, likelihood of being able to preserve life if it ever was there? And then what is the astrobiological quality of returned samples? Meaning if we take samples from there, what is the odds we're gonna be able to do something with that to look for signs of life? And then the petrological quality of return samples. So petrological means, you know, study of rocks. So basically, okay, if we don't find life, do we at least learn some cool geology about Mars? And then we would take averages with this. I can tell you when I started doing this um, was right around 2015. And I remember my PhD advisor at the time, I asked him, what do you think the landing site's gonna be? And he said, Jezero is probably probably going to be the one. And it was still years of debate after that that did eventually come out on top. So even from the get-go, I think that was selected as this is probably the strongest contender, but there was still multiple years of going back and forth about the pros and the cons. And a lot of these other sites, maybe they'll get their chance in the future. But so something else that goes into how do you decide when you want to uh, go to a place, you have to decide, okay, if we're going to be drilling rocks, if we're going to be analyzing stuff, we have to make sure these rovers are equipped with the right equipment to be able to do that. So um, this is at uh, a NASA facility where they were testing a lot of the drill bits. They were testing how well do a lot of these rocks drill. Um, you can see that they were trying to drill some uh, cores here, which are just long cylinders, and they were shattering sometimes. And this is also an early prototype of, if you remember that tube I showed you, how could you maybe collect cylindrical tube samples of rocks and store them and then send them back to the planet? So a lot of engineering goes into this stuff, but the end result of that is the Perseverance rover that you see right here. So this is the Perseverance rover using the arm. It will go up to rocks of interest and drill cores out of them. And then you can see it brings that core back to the rover. It's called the sample carousel because it spins around. You can see the tube is sitting inside of there. And then it has a mechanism on the bottom of it that it will grab it. Then it will seal it. And then eventually it will actually leave them. And you know, you might be wondering, okay, why are we spending billions of dollars to go litter on another planet, right? But this rover is not bringing them back to Earth, but we are sending another rover in the future this is a much smaller rover there. It will have some type of, and this is a prototype design. I'm actually not sure if it, how much it's evolved since I've, I've gotten this image, but we will have a rover that goes along and actually picks up these samples that were collected by the rover. It's going to load them into a lander over here that it's going to have kind of like I just showed you where it can put all of those tubes in a container. And then it is going to shoot them out into orbit around Mars and eventually back to Earth. So we are collecting samples from Mars to eventually be studied in laboratories back here on Earth. I'm not sure at this point what the current estimate of when they will be back. It's at least going to be uh, a couple of years into the 2030s at this point. So this mission landed uh, just at the start of 2021. And, you know, it's basically going to be over a decade before we get these samples back here. And the samples for, for a size context are about the size of my pinky here. So they are very, very small. Um, the whole world is going to want to analyze them. So it's going to, there's going to be some fierce competition. So from this mission, this is a current ongoing astrobiology mission looking for signs of life on another planet, but it's specifically looking for signs of extinct microorganisms okay that is what it's that is what it's going to be looking for so you can imagine here based on what i've told you um we might be running into a circumstance if we're lucky we'll find something that looks like a fossilized bacteria but we might get something back where you know this is basically what we get and there's some faint little tube-like structure and then everyone gets to debate for the next several decades is that a fossil you know is that a billion year old bacteria from mars um, so that'll be interesting to see what happens with that. So to bridge this into the next part of the talk here, it's talking about the search for uh, life in the universe. I haven't really used this word alien. Um, it's kind of a charged word, right? It's got a lot of science fiction behind it. But what I want you to get out of this is that, yes, if we find bacteria on another planet, 
that is that meets the definition of alien, right? That is life from another planet. But okay, there's also other types of aliens, right? That everyone might be interested in, right? So oftentimes when people get real interested about aliens, it's talking about what about intelligent life, right? We're not talking about bacteria. We're talking about something that can think, um, you know, maybe something that is as smart or even smarter than a human, right? Which, you know, keep your opinions on how easy that is to do to yourselves for now. So the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is what I'm going to be talking about now. And I really like this quote. So this is by uh, Philip Morrison. The probability of success is difficult to estimate, but if we never search, the chance of success is zero. So um, there's a lot, like I said, there's a lot of science fiction behind aliens, intelligent life out there. But what I want to convey now is that this is actually a legitimate scientific effort that is happening. So does anybody know what we are looking at right here? This is where we live. This is the Milky Way galaxy. So that's us right there. You know, I think you can see a few of you blinked in this photo, right? So if we look at a measurement of the Milky Way galaxy, we measure this in light years. So the Milky Way is over 100,000 light years across. So once again, a light year is distance, not time, not. And the reason we use light years for that, which by the way, is the amount of distance that light travels in one year is because if we were to give this in miles, it would be that many miles, you know, and that's just basically meaningless, right? Um, this is the number of stars we think are in the Milky Way, and that's the number of planets. That is just in the Milky Way galaxy. The number of galaxies that exist are thought to be in the trillions. So if you start doing the math there, we're getting into unfathomable amounts of stars and planets. So even if you think, okay, the odds for life to evolve elsewhere are one in a trillion, well, there's trillions of opportunities right there for that to be able to happen. So one of my favorite images ever, this is the Hubble Deep Field taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And one of my favorite images, uh, little tidbits about this, that if you kind of hold out your hand up towards the sky, the amount of the sky that this covers is about like will be blotted out by your finger at arm's length away. So it's a very, very, very small amount of the night sky. But there are a few stars in this image. Anything you see with the four spikes coming off of it, like there's one right there and there's one at the bottom here. Those are stars. Everything else in this is a galaxy. Every other speck of light you see in here is a galaxy, each with probably billions or trillions of planets inside of them. So you can see why scientists think, okay, let's start looking to see if we can find any evidence that there's other life out there. So this brings us to famous organizations like SETI, which stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. So this is actually a real, it was more of a proof of concept done by SETI where they sent out a signal in binary of ones and zeros to recreate this image, which shows, it's kind of complicated, but it shows some of the chemical elements needed for life. It shows what a double helix would look like. That's supposed to be a person. You know, I don't know if an alien gets that, they're gonna be like, oh, naturally that's a human down there. And this is supposed to be the very famous Arecibo telescope on the bottom there, which again, it's basically pixel art, but we are sending an art project out to the, the potential aliens, right? But if you're not familiar, this is the Arecibo telescope. So it's very famous for, honestly, a lot of times it's just because it's in a lot of movies, but this was in uh, Puerto Rico. So one of the projects it was famously involved with is Project Serendip, which stands for the search for extraterrestrial radio emissions from nearby developed intelligent populations, okay? Notice the nearby in there because it's gonna take us a long time to listen in on stuff that's far away. But um, if you've seen the movie uh, Contact, or you've seen some of the old James Bond movies, that's where this is taking place. So it's a, it was pretty pop culture famous, but um, this is the type of data that this telescope used to collect. So you could actually, they would crowdsource this and you could run this on your computer, but it was just 
listening to outer space. And what it's looking at here is it's just trying to see, is there any signal that looks different? Because space is actually noisy, contrary to what you might think. There's a bunch of stuff happening in space. If we are listening in, we're going to be getting a whole bunch of noise. But if you were listening to radio waves from our planet or something like that, something that was evidence of like uh, intentional technology that we were doing, it would look different. Maybe it would be a big peak. Maybe it would be a consistently repeating pattern. This was running for quite a while. There was never anything that was like, oh, slam dunk. That must be from aliens. But again, this was uh, running for quite a long time there. And now there have been a few false positives just in the greater search for extraterrestrial intelligence. This is one of my famous uh, examples here. So this is scientist Jocelyn Bell. I don't know if you've heard of this before, but this was something that she discovered. Does anybody know what this is called? It's a very interesting phenomenon that can happen in outer space. So this this is a this is a pulsar. That's right. Yeah. So the name that was given to pulsar. So you can see it's just it's releasing highly. It's it, What's happening here is it's a highly magnetized neutron star, okay? And it's emitting electromagnetic radiation from its poles. So every now and then, one of those poles was going in front of, you know, whatever, wherever we were listening to. And that was like, whoa, there's a different signal. What's going on there? Eventually, it was discovered that, okay, it's actually a natural phenomenon. It's just a neutron star. But still to this day, the name that is given to neutron stars kind of in jest is they go by naming convention of LGM and then a number after it. And the LGM stands for little green men because they thought, oh, is this aliens that we're seeing there? Another famous example is the wow signal. And the reason it's called the wow signal is because uh, it was printing off a bunch of it was listening for noise, you know, a little bit of noise would be a one, a little bit more would be a two. And then you can see right here, it went off the charts. It started getting into letters and numbers and the person circled it and said, wow, is this a sign, you know? And to give you a little visualization here, all the blue that you see over there is what just normal space looked like when they were listening into signals. And then you can see this bright, bright area right there and thought, okay, is that a sign of, you know, is that an alien trying to communicate with us? And this actually happened at the Ohio State University in their Big Ear Radio Telescope is what it was called. And it came from the Sagittarius constellation. Um, so it had some of the hallmarks of being of potential extraterrestrial origin. But the fatal flaw here is that it could never be reproduced. So as far as science goes, that's pretty fatal. Of Okay, we saw something. Do we see it again? Nope, it was a one-time thing. Um, I think currently the leading hypothesis is that it was something, a reflection of a signal sent from Earth that bounced back and we caught, but we might never know. Um, unfortunately, for this Arecibo telescope, it is not in great shape anymore. So uh, a few years ago now, it I mean, it was kind of neglected for a while. A lot of its funding got cut. It finally literally collapsed under its own weight. So a lot of those, you know, those bar graphs that I showed you before, those have ceased um, for the time being. But now there are a bunch of other telescopes that are doing the same thing. We basically discovered, okay, we can listen to space just as well with a bunch of tiny telescopes in a big field than we can with one giant telescope. And this has the benefit if you can kind of build it as you go. Like you can use 20 telescopes until you can get 30, until you can get 40, and your data just keeps getting better and better. So here's a couple of the you know, very cleverly named, very large array and Allen telescope array. So cheaper to build, um, but not cheap enough, unfortunately. So out of the 350 dishes that were built by like 2007 or so, a lot of them went in, they went offline by like 2011. Um, sometimes they got brought back online, but now only about 42 of these are are currently running. So it's expensive to do this type of stuff, but they are still going. Next up here, I'd like to talk about the Voyager mission. So some of you probably remember this. This is a really cool mission. And I want to bring your attention to right where you see that red arrow right there, that little gold circle there. That is the famous Voyager record. So this was Earth's attempt to make contact or to kind of like message in a bottle, leave evidence that we existed to 
anyone who might find it, anyone or anything that might find it in the future. So this on the very bottom left of the record there, that is our cosmic address. It's kind of got where we are located within the Milky Way galaxy. We had a bunch of images put onto this. So the first image was of planet Earth, and that's what this is trying to show. Hey, if you're looking, um, that's that's what the first image is going to be. And here's how you're supposed to read them. It was basically put in a sequence that you had to read up and down like that, and it would generate an image kind of in a binary sense. Um, and we put a bunch of music on it. So there's stuff from Chuck Berry that's on this. Um, as you can see here, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see the sounds of Earth. So um, I don't know if anyone here remembers Carl Sagan um, when he was with his wife as well, that they asked her to, you know, think about, they recorded her um, brain waves when it was, think about what it's like to fall in love. And a lot of, you know, kind of very um, poetic human experience stuff like that was put on this, strapped onto something, which is now the as we know it, farthest man-made object from uh, from Earth. So it's just it's just out there now. Maybe and you know, and the reason it's gold, by the way, is that that's a way to make sure it doesn't degrade so much in outer space. And who knows if it'll be picked up someday in the future. But I wanted to go over some of the images that are on this thing. It was a lot of just like monotonous human life stuff, like your day-to-day -day tasks. So here is a woman grocery shopping. This was actually a picture of the uh, Arecibo telescope with 305 meters. That's how wide across it was. This is my absolute favorite image from it. It's people showing the various ways we can consume things on Earth. This woman licking an ice cream cone, this guy eating a sandwich with already a very exaggerated bite taken out of it. And this guy just, you know, drinking water from a jug like that. So I like them. Um, and, you know, we had stuff like this, more purely scientific stuff where, hey, this is what our atmosphere is made of. You know, we've got nitrogen, oxygen, uh, water, carbon dioxide, all that type of stuff. So this is a really interesting effort of humans being like, hey, if anyone's out there, here's some, you know, here's some cool stuff about us. Um, now for a slightly different topic is the Kepler Space Telescope. Has anyone heard of that in here before? This is another interesting way that we are looking for potential signs of life out there. So this is a telescope that's just in orbit. It's sitting there and it is doing something called uh, measuring by the transit method. So what we have here is a planet crossing in front of a star. That's it. So if you're looking at the total light that's output by a star and something passes in front of it, it's going to get momentarily a little bit dimmer, even if it doesn't totally block it out. So. It'll be like if this is your star and a planet does this, you can see a little uh, a little dip in brightness. And it's so sensitive that it can even tell a little bit about, okay, based on what happened to that dip in the brightness, we might be able to tell what the atmosphere is made of. And therefore, if it could control or, or possibly support life. Also, if we manage to catch a planet that goes around twice, just with that little bit of information, we can tell how big it is, um, we can tell what, you know, what the year is, how far it probably is from the sun. And that gives us a lot of information on potentially how close it is, meaning could liquid water exist there? Um, so this is an example of what that, that uh, graph might be where it's just time and brightness. So literally all you're seeing is constant brightness till a planet goes over it and then it dips. And then when the planet is no longer in front of the sun, that is, back to normal. And this is why that's important. So we can look for something called the habitable zone, also sometimes known as the Goldilocks zone, where you want a planet to be just right in terms of distance from its star, where if it's too close, all of the water will evaporate and then you can't have life there. All life that we know it needs some type of liquid water um, to exist. If it's just right like Earth, we can have water that cycles between all states of, of matter. We can have you know ice, we can have steam, we can have water. And if it's too far away, it will be totally frozen and you know, you're not gonna be able to use that. Now I should mention that this is a very human centric way of looking at things because there's a lot of microorganisms, a lot of bacteria that live just fine on ice or in much hotter conditions than we possibly can. And then the recently launched James Webb Space Telescope 
This is basically, it's a super Hubble, it's a super uh, Kepler space telescope, basically, in that it can really, really look at these faraway planets called exoplanets, and it can um, potentially even characterize their atmospheres to be able to tell, like, you know, if there were possibly uh, intelligent life there that were burning fossil fuels, we'd be able to actually read that from Earth just by looking at their atmosphere with this thing. And now the part of your talk, the talk that I think everyone will be interested in here is I want to talk about uh, convincing evidence for alien life visiting Earth. Okay. That's your convincing evidence for alien life visiting <laughs> Earth right there. Okay. Now, this gets a lot of PR. And like, okay, I'm guilty every now and then of watching those ancient aliens things and stuff like that. But what I want to just caution everybody about here is older civilizations that existed um, were not stupid. They just didn't have the technology that we had. So when you start getting into studies of old civilizations, a lot of the people were expert uh, expert at crafting, um, great engineers. There's a lot of skill that went into their societies. It was just, you know, they might not have had computers or other type of advanced technology to be able to do that type of stuff. So when we start talking about, okay, pyramids, you know, the, the Nazca lines, these Maui heads, they must have been by aliens. It's it's really, you know, it, it doesn't have basis in, in reality. There's not really evidence for that. Um, we, on the contrary, have a lot of evidence that people from these societies were very clever and, you know, had a lot of time to do cool stuff like this, right? So one of my favorite examples being, okay, these Maui heads here, they're, they're way too heavy. Uh, how could they have possibly moved them? You know, naturally must have been aliens, right? But then we had some uh, some scientists who went there and, uh, oh, could they walk? Well, let's, oh, okay. It turns out you can just play some tug of war there and walk those across the islands. And in fact, we did find those paths that were kind of carved all over the islands from that. So that being said, I've just given you all these reasons that like, hey, okay, we know there's a lot of planets out there. Life maybe could exist, right? But so, okay, why haven't we found anyone yet? And this is a topic of debate, but the easiest answer and the most likely answer is space is really, really, really big. So think about how fast we can send out some of these signals. Think about the momentary glimpse of, of Earth's history that we would have been able to receive a radio signal and know that that's a radio signal. That's, you know, that's just in the last hundred years that that was possible, right? Um, how much of human history will be able to send out signals? That's also very, very recent. So like entire civilizations could rise and fall and not overlap with each other. Or, you know, we could be sending out signals that might not get to somebody until millions of years later or might be so distorted from passing through space by that time that, um, you know, it doesn't work. So I do get asked a lot like, oh, so this is like number one question I get. So if anyone is going to ask, ask me this, I will just answer it now. Do I think aliens exist? Personally, intelligent life? Personally, yes, I do. Probably just given the immense amount of planets and opportunities for life out there, probably. But that is a subjective opinion that is not based on any scientific evidence. It's mostly me just being like, hey, there seems like there's a lot of opportunities out there. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, do I think we might find evidence of life in our own solar system, intelligent life? Personal opinion, probably not. Um, who would want to come here? Yeah, that's yeah. Who would want to come here? You, you know, I, it depends on what they ask me. Um, might we have find evidence of bacterial life someplace in our solar system? Might these missions to Mars be successful? Maybe. That I think is a lot more likely. I'd say it's about a 50-50 that is successful or not. There's also the potential that maybe bacterial life did exist on Mars and we're just not gonna be looking in the right spots. Um, but this is still a priority for NASA um, and other space agencies around the world. Um, so this is just gonna keep going and going and going. And I mentioned this before, but I've been a little bit involved with planning efforts for humans going to Mars. So rovers are great, but they're big, they're bulky, they can't move that fast. A lot of science that's going to be crucial to our understanding of other planets is going to require us to go there, especially Mars. 
This is already being planned by NASA. And currently it's really just at the brainstorming stage of, okay, if humans go there, we're gonna be weight limited. They don't want humans just walking around on the surface too much because there's a lot of radiation on Mars. But what instruments do you bring with us? What samples from Mars do you bring back? But any way you cut it, humans are going to be able to do a lot more detailed science than a rover will be able to. And they'll be able to actually set up laboratories on the surface of Mars and just do a lot of science there and maybe even send stuff back to Earth and have a lot more detailed science done and, and you know, big laboratory equipment that we don't want to really uh, build on Mars. So this is all coming. Um, you know, anyone in here who is a little kid and interested in this type of stuff, you might be prime astronaut age for exploring Mars yourself one day. So keep that in mind. And I like to end these on a to be continued because like, you know, we are at the infancy of knowing a lot of this stuff. And I think, you know, not even in, you're not even gonna have to wait decades. I think in the next several years, we're gonna know a lot more about the potential for life in the universe and, you know, maybe even have some uh, potential signs of it. So with that, I will open the floor for questions, but I wanna say thank you to everyone for joining me tonight and hope you enjoyed the talk. All right, so any questions? Yes. Have you had anything to do with the upcoming uh, lunar mission? Ah, the, if I had anything to do with the upcoming lunar mission. So the most I had to do with that was at a conference, I basically pitched, hey, I think this would be good science to do on the moon. And, you know, kind of went into the, the pot of, you know, suggestions from the greater scientific community on what to do with that. But um, that is all also ongoing. And the nice part about that is that's close enough that we can keep potentially doing new things on the moon. So that'll be an interesting one to follow as well. Yeah, Artemis mission, if anyone wants to look into it. Yes. So the scientists have been searching for primarily carbon. Yes. What are the chances of life existing consistent of fire Okay, great question. So we've been looking mostly for carbon-based life. If you didn't know, we are carbon-based life. Um, what is the chance of other life existing, um, of other elements? So the nice part about, and I don't wanna to get too much into chemistry class here, but carbon has four valence electrons, which is a fancy way of saying it can make a bunch of different compounds. It likes binding with a bunch of different things. Another common element that can do that is silicon, um, but it has a lot of disadvantages. It tends to make a lot more solid structures that are less permeable to water. Carbon is really good at letting water go in and out, which if you can think of you know, any basic human biological function, that is an important aspect of living essentially. So is there a chance we could find non-carbon based life? Yes. And there are even, for instance, um, one of the moons titan we think there might be liquid methane on the surface instead of liquid water is it possible life could use liquid methane yes but like we're basically just it's easiest for us to start currently as we're in the kind of infancy of this search it's easiest us easiest for us to start looking for what we know but i can tell you there is a entire effort by nasa uh called the search for agnostic biosignatures, where it's how do we search for life as we don't know it? And that's just, you know, a whole other can of worms, but yes, it's possible and who knows what we'll find. Yes. Could you define dark energy and dark matter? Oh man, this is, can I define dark energy and dark matter? That is like, how many hours you got here? You know, this is, that is absolutely outside of my area of expertise here. What I will say is that that is throwing scientists for a nutshell. It's still not quite clear, you know, if we have, um, you know, dark matter is is stuff that makes up the universe that we are, we, we can basically detect that it exists, but we don't have direct evidence that it exists. And it's, yeah, I'm not, I'm gonna stop talking there for a fear of not saying something incorrect. So yeah, <laughs> but yeah, good question. Yes. So you mentioned that obviously it was, Yes. Yes. Is this simply a US based effort or is this 
Yes, good question. So if we get these samples back from Mars, they're just going to be the United States looking at them. Well, we do have a joint effort with the European Space Agency, but um, first and foremost, what's going to happen is these samples are going to come back to NASA facilities and they're going to basically be put into a quarantine where they make sure everything's safe, they detect what's on there, um, there's going to be some disinfecting that goes on there, and then what they want to do is, and this number keeps changing every time I hear something about it, but they want to take about half of each sample, so half of each pinky-sized sample, and store it for later, for decades down the line, and we might get better technology that allows us to analyze it now. And then as of what's going to happen with that remaining little bit, basically um, the current idea is, you know, NASA scientists get first dibs, but after that it's gonna be, people can put in proposals from all over the world to be like, this is why you should give me, you know, a, a centimeter sliver of this thing so I can do this crazy science on there. And that's going to be super competitive. And also people are really going to have to propose to do some crazy science to get that, but it could potentially go anywhere. Yep. Yes. Can you tell me and help me to understand how astronauts are going to live on the surface of Mars? What kind of creative engineering and create, uh, creative chemistry are they coming up with since it's an atmosphere? of CO2 and there's essentially more magnetic field. Yes, yeah, great question. So how are humans possibly going to live on Mars? Because it's not a great place to live. So there's a lot of science that goes into that. There's also, even on this current Perseverance rover, there is a, a device that's learning how to make oxygen from the Martian atmosphere. So basically the idea is we will build our own enclosures that we can um, synthesize our own water, our own oxygen and you know have food that we either bring with us or potentially grow but a lot of it is going to be um you know this is all just in the brainstorming uh sense currently but a lot of it is going to be making sure they're not out on the planet for too long so at this recent meeting i went to to talk about planning for potential human missions to mars it was the first missions are going to be 30 days so astronauts are going to go there and they're going to just be there for 30 days and eventually maybe ramping up to like a 300 day mission but it's going to have strict um you know rules for how long they can be outside and it's like not like a couple hours a day maybe or something like that and uh but I'm not super involved with like the bio side of like how are they making these enclosures a lot of those are still like really just not finalized and in the brainstorming capabilities but it's it'll be interesting you know when they first go there they're probably going to live like in the spaceship there's going to be you know something where there's a room that they can set up and then eventually expand to on the ground habitats but all of that none of that has been decided yet yes you know how old mars is the young planet like earth was yes so the, the nice part is all of the terrestrial planets or the rocky planets in our in our solar system, they all formed at the exact same time. So they all formed right around 13-ish, you know, billion years ago. And um, I'm sorry, four or something billion years ago, four and a half billion years ago. Um, so that's when they eventually coalesced. You know, that's why we have a lot of the rocky bits closer towards the sun, just because of, you know, that's how that's how mass works there. So um, in terms of there, there is huge error bars for Mars on how long ago it lost its water. That is like, some people say it was, it lost its water 3 billion years ago. Some people say it was 2 billion years ago. So that's one of the reasons we want to go to Mars more because every time we go there, we learn vastly different things. We, there's still a lot about Mars. We do not know, but yeah, it formed right when earth did. Yep. Any other questions? I will also say you can feel free to come up here afterwards. I'll do uh, you can do two more here, and then you can feel free to come up and talk afterwards. Yes. Mm -hmm. How probable or accurate is the paradox the Yes. So um, the Fermi paradox, um, you know, basically states that there's so many opportunities for life. Why? Don't we have any evidence of it? And then the the great filter is space is the great filter, just the sheer distance there. Um, what was the third one you mentioned? Yeah, and can can you tell me a little bit more about that one? The theory that a sequence of shapes is the universe is or reach some point greater 
Gotcha. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add another one into this. There's something called the Drake equation, um, which is basically just a thought process on what's the likelihood of finding other intelligent life in the universe. And a big, uh, a big variable that goes into that is how long do you think human civilization will last? And it's basically how much of an optimist or a pessimist are you? You know, there's some people who are like, you know, it's going to be, we're going to nuke ourselves in the next, you know, 50 years or something like that. But, um, yeah, so I will say those all bring up good points, but they're mostly just like thought exercises, and which, by the way, have great merit. Like, why why don't we have evidence of life out there? You know, is it just because of this great filter that space is, is so large that we will realistically never communicate with another uh, intelligent life out there? Like, that is very possible. Um, I know a lot of people who say like that is they would they would place their money that never in all of human history will we ever make contact with another intelligent life. I'm like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. So that's all just to each their own type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you did mention um moons Yes. Yeah. There's other moons out there. There's um Enceladus, there's Europa, where they think there's global oceans and stuff like that. Those are also efforts that are um those are more like subsurface oceans where we think there's like an icy crust and there are missions planned to some of those, and there's also missions planned to Titan. Um, a lot of those are still kind of in the earlier planning stages and are more strictly starting off with exploring the planet and seeing what they find in general. And, you know, maybe later on down the line doing a specific life detection mission there. But some people do say that, you know, we know that they're warm and have water as well. So that could be another great place in our solar system to look for microbial life. Yeah. Yes, and we'll do. having been both on the research side mm -hmm. and now, yes, what if say, for instance, I as an average citizen, I find these programs, these programs to be important, these features to be important. What do you think is the most effective way that I, as an average citizen, can try to encourage this or funding these programs? Do you mean the space programs in general space or programs, research programs? I think. Science, science yeah, you know, this is space travel and space research. That, that's a great question, by the way. So a lot of discoveries that we have, you know, everything from mammograms to better flight technology to computers and stuff like that are the result of like NASA funding that has gone on. Um, in terms of effective science communication in general, that is like, you know, if you find out, you know, there's definite don't do X, Y, and Z methods of it. Unfortunately, the most effective ways to communicate science are also the most time consuming, like relating to people on a personal level, having actual conversations with people, um, being able to have back and forth where you present data and why you think these things. I will say the most important thing, and this is for communicating science, um, not only communicating science, but for communicating anything is like, give people the benefit of the doubt that like, you know, they will want to learn something. Don't come at it from an antagonistic standpoint. Cause there's, there's, if you've been on the internet, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of comments of, you know, you idiot, how could you not know this type of thing as well? But, um, you know, so give people the benefit of the doubt when you're communicating with them. And, you know, a lot of people, um, are more willing to listen to information than you might initially uh, expect with that and how to advocate for that in general. Um, I mean, everything from writing to your senators to supporting, I mean, NASA has a lot of initiatives to get involved with, um, to, you know, hey, going to a program at your local library and stuff like that too. So yeah, I mean, any way that's that's in, engagement is, is good in the long term. So yeah, this this stuff definitely, I mean, as I showed in here, a lot of these current efforts for humans on Mars and stuff like that. This is stuff that, you know, kids in preschool now are going to be the ones who actually do. So this is, you know, this is stuff that always goes full circle. I don't know if that really answered your question, but it's very, it's very broad, but you know, it's, yeah. I, I, I will say, I think every penny that NASA and other scientific agencies get go to an overall greater good cause for not only the United States, but the world in general.
And with that, I know we are at 731 here. If anyone would like to come up afterwards, I'm happy to talk as well. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. the public where you are. So at Yale, they do every now and then, I believe. Um, and you at a Yeah. So I'm I'm mostly in like Harvard, so I'm not actually this distinctive department, but they do have stuff they advertise across campus.